Hi, everyone. Welcome to my uh, little show, I guess, on Fridays, where I get to, uh, uh, to do this all access thing where I talk with you about the things that have been on my mind, where we go over the week's events in blockchain, where we talk about the science and engineering of blockchain technology. We talk a little bit about the business side of things and what's happening and uh, what the ramifications of various things around the ecosystem are for, for those of us who are sort of uh, engaged with, uh, with what's happening in blockchains. So um, it's been a crazy week. It's been a very, very fun week. And, um, and I want to start by, uh, by delving into some technical topics and then, uh, and then maybe answering some Q&A questions. I know that I tweeted yesterday and got a lot of interesting questions. I'll try to cover as many of them as I can. But the first question, the thing that's been foremost in my mind, the thing that's been occupying my time, I would say for about the last uh, two years, actually, is this question of subnets. What are they? What do they do? What can we expect of them? And, uh, and, uh, and what are they good for? How does one use them? And how does one plug into them? So um, I want to just give you a glimpse of what subnets are. They're a unique concept. They're unique to Avalanche. Um, there are only two other chains that have something at all related to them that I know of that, that's implemented. Um, and uh, so uh, we were one of the first people to develop this notion of a subnet. Now, before I describe what it is, um, I, I know it's going to sound, to some people, it's going to sound like they're going to do like, what is this all about and why do I need it? And those are the very same people um, who, you know, back in the Bitcoin days and when Ethereum was coming out and Ethereum folks came in and said, look, we want to change the virtual machine. The Bitcoin virtual machine allows only Bitcoin transfers and we want to change it. So it's a Turing complete machine. You can do any computation you like, general computations. And a, a lot of hardline Bitcoiners were back then. And even now they would, they would view this with suspicion. They're like, why do I need that? All I need is my Bitcoin balance and I want it to go to the moon. And that's all I care about. I don't need this computation. I don't need the ability to run arbitrary programs. Why would I want to play Tetris on a blockchain, et cetera? That was the sort of the derisive commentary that people, uh, people came back with. And we know that the transition from Bitcoin to a simple asset registry to a generalized computation platform was a huge one. Opening up and generalizing the virtual machine enabled a huge number of, uh, of different kinds of uh, functionality and use cases to be accommodated inside the Ethereum virtual machine. So, um, I mean, we can argue, you know, how good the EVM was, uh, some of the micro choices there. If you looked into the micro decisions from an engineering perspective, starting with the size of the words, uh, going on with various uh, various different primitives. Uh, you know, we can argue about whether or not those were done well, but the the idea that we went from a, from a very simple virtual machine to a to a uh, a more expanded, a more um, a more uh, well, a Turing complete um, virtual machine is a huge one. And subnets, due to the the network layer, what a Turing complete virtual machine did. Uh, in the uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin switch. That is, Avalanche's subnets allow the customization of the network layer. And in so doing, they open up a vast array of uh, use cases. And what are these use cases? What can you do? And what are subnets? A subnet is uh, essentially an ability to run a set of nodes with a custom virtual machine of your own choosing to do whatever the heck you might want to do. Now, why is this interesting? First of all, before we came onto the scene, you know, back in the early days when uh, we were thinking about you know, how to design Avalanche, what its features ought to be, et cetera. Uh, so the, there was a, a perception that you had only two kinds of blockchains. You had permissionless blockchains, like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, or you had private permission blockchains. There's nothing in the middle. There's a big chasm. And uh, permissionless blockchains do what they do today. And the permissioned ones, um, you know, companies like R3, et cetera, were in the business of churning these out. They have done more than uh, several hundred permissionless, sorry, permissioned blockchain proofs of concept. Every single company in the Fortune Top 500 
minus maybe five of them, the stragglers, you know, the cement companies, maybe even the cement companies, I'm sure have done permission blockchain deployments. Everybody had a play. They all want to know what this new technology is. They realize they'll be left behind. They want to play with it and they would go and, uh, and craft a solution or get a solution crafted for them. And they would deploy a, a little network of their own. Why do they have to do this? Why did every single company feel the need to experiment with a private chain? Well, there's a, if you don't understand this, you won't be able to understand what is about to happen. And you will think that perhaps you can, you can go into this with what we've got, with the technology, with the old technology that we have, and, uh, and it'll be apparent uh, very, very quickly to you that it's just not capable of handling the use cases that you do need to handle. So what do they want? They want something very simple. They want something that you would want if you had something really, really valuable in your hand and you wanted to tokenize it, you want to fractionalize it, you want to digitize it. Well, what is that? Well, that's simply the ability to control the full lifetime of a digital asset. What does that mean? Imagine that I have something in my hand, whatever it might be. I have a bunch of, let's say, houses in New York City, or I have you know, real estate. I have a bunch of gold or whatever. And, uh, and I live in a, in a, under some kind of a legal regime. Okay? I, I am not extra legal. I am not you know, further than 20 miles from the nearest coast of the United States. I am not in that funky river between Croatia and Serbia. There's a little island there for those of you who don't know. Uh, so when the borders were drawn, uh, Croatia drew one border, Serbia drew one border, and there's an island that's left over. It floods occasionally, but there is no, there is no legal jurisdiction in that, in that little island. So these are all crazy, crazy locations. And there's like, you know, the oil platforms in the North Sea. So there are crazy people who, who think about living on, on, on locations like that. There are crazy people who think that we should be in a lawless society. And, uh, and we're not one, I'm not one of them. Okay, so we live in the world that we have today. We have laws, and mostly <laughs> those laws are, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of them are there for a reason. There's at least some good intent behind them. Uh, sure, there might be all sorts of issues. And of course, at any given time, all of many of us are engaged in trying to make them better. But, but there's a reason why, why they're there. And certainly, there's a requirement to comply with them. So how do you comply with this set of rules around you that can change at any time. So today there's an embargo to North Korea, and I don't know about what's going to happen tomorrow, and things can change. And when things change, you need to have a plan. And I, I don't know if that point keeps, keeps you know, it, it needs to be repeated, but if you are a compliant company or a multi-billion dollar company with large value assets in your hands, and you want to digitize them, you want the world to be able to trade these assets, and you have compliance restrictions, you need to comply with whatever might come down the pipe. Well, then you need to have some kind of a process for being able to say, look, I control what happens on my network. This is the reason why people ran to permission networks. And they find very quickly that when you have a permission network, it's pretty much impossible to keep it going. I would expect, I would say that the minimum critical size for the financial value of a network is at least, I would say, $2 billion. If it falls below that, then it just can, tends to dissipate. It's, it's very hard to maintain it. That's why these private permissioned affairs, they never last long. The participants, they find other interests. Um, you know, Just find me one, one permissioned uh, uh, blockchain experiment that actually blossomed into a mission critical deployment. Just one. I'll give you one. Um, it was it was uh, done by Burger King, and uh, it was called Whopper Coin, and uh, they digitized the uh, the sort of the the frequent flyer mile kind of things. Like the you get a point for every burger you eat. Uh, this was done across the globe. It was very popular in Russia, I think, and they used my uh, my technology for this. And I think that's the only one I know. Uh, they they used my consensus protocol a long time ago uh, for for Whopper Coin. So that's cool um, and interesting, but you know, out of many hundreds of, uh, of deployments, none of them went anywhere. So, so we have a situation and it's, it's so obvious if you look backwards. The obvious thing is every single person with an asset, with a really valuable asset in the real world has legal requirements around that asset. They're not just optional. You can't just be like, 
I'm 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 a you know I'm gonna live in my own universe or I'm moving out to to that island between Serbia and, and, and Croatia or whatever. It's just you have restrictions, you have to be able to provide a guarantee. If you're going to digitize this, you're gonna to have to go to if you're at a big company, you're gonna to have to go to your legal department and say, hey, here is the legal framework. And it cannot be a YOLO framework. You have to be able to say, this is the network that I have created. This is the, the legal control that goes down to the leaves. And by leaves, I mean validators, the constituents of a network. This is the legal framework that goes and affects every single participant inside this network that I have crafted. And that's how I manage, I will manage to remain compliant for the future. So that's, that's one of the big pushes from every single enterprise when it comes to blockchains. That's why they went to permission blockchains. And yet they found that because the value was not sufficient, because the network effects weren't there, because the synergies were not there, that these things tend to die out. Consortia uh, protocol, consortia networks don't last long. So, uh, so what's happening now? Well, we're seeing the DeFi thing blossom. That's fantastic. But these other assets are lying idle. They want to be. They're, they're, they're aching to be blockchainified, but they're off, off those things. They're on balance sheets, but off chain. So to be able to accommodate them, you need to be able to provide to these, uh, these, uh, these people with, with valuable assets that, that need to be digitized and traded a platform where they can control the, full, the assets through their full lifetime. And the way to do that in the Avalanche network is by allowing them to create what we call a subnet, a set of nodes that fulfill a certain criteria that allows them to, in good conscience, go and deploy whatever their use case might be. So how might this play out? Well, here's a simple example. You are, let's say, a company, a very big company. Okay, let's say you're Siemens. And, um, you know, you, you manufacture 80% uh, of those gates at parking lots that come up and down, okay? And you manufacture 80% of the world's parking meters. And um, now what are we gonna do? You have an obligation that the gate must be able to rise when someone's at in front of it and has paid their due, okay? So surely it would be fantastic to be able to put all of these devices on a blockchain, to control them in a decentralized fashion. You would get all the benefits of decentralization. You'd get all the robustness. But if you were to do this and you were to say, well, sometimes when uh, there's other stuff happening, maybe somebody's selling NFTs, then the gate might take, I don't know, a few hours to rise. That's a clear no-go. <laughs> you just lost the entirety of that entire use case. So um, you need performance isolation. That's one of the main reasons why uh, subnets are incredibly useful. You want dedicated networks for dedicated uses. A second use case, you want to be able to, to make financial uh, uh, predictions, forecasts of what it will take to, uh, to transact your favorite things. So I want to, let's say, uh, uh, take, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, uh, debt obligations, right? Some financial product, and I, I'm going to be trading these things. I need to know that trading this thing is not going to be beyond the abilities of the participants to the system. So if every single transaction is going to cost $500 just because there's some exciting DeFi activity or some ICO going on or some, uh, some really, you know, whatever it is that's happening on the network that day, then suddenly you will find yourself at a huge disadvantage because all your financial project projections will break down. Your fees on a shared permissionless network are not under your control. And the fee structure might very well have to be different from the default networks. Some participants might have to use your network for free, but how do you do that? Okay, so you need a different kind of a fee structure in your own realm for your kinds of assets. That's two. Um, third use case has to do with, uh, with performance. So suppose you have some asset that really, really needs to be transacted very fast, and, uh, and the default network is just not fast enough. That is, um, you want to say, look, uh, there's a default network out there, and it, cons you know, it, it consists of, it's comprised of a bunch of nodes that, were, uh, uh, that came together, and uh, those nodes are fine, and there are many thousands of them. Maybe I don't need that decentralization. Maybe I'm happy. Maybe I am a large exchange, and, and 
and a, and a large VC firm that buddied up, and I want to create uh, uh, I want to create um, a uh, uh, I want to create a new token, and uh, I'm not going to let's call it uh, Olana. I'm going to create an Olana coin, and to participate, you're going to need very 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 large uh, computers. Because you know, I don't, I don't have a good technique at the fundamental level for speeding up my protocol. So I'm just going to throw hardware at it. And uh, I realize that this is going to reduce centralization, but you know, no one cares for our Olana coin. Uh, we just want the fastest machines ever. So, uh, so to participate in my network, you have to have fast, fast nodes. And that's perfectly OK. Um, but you should be able to do it. That's not a desirable thing, at least in my view. And if you, if you really like these systems and, and the thing that draws you to them is probably decentralization. So for most of you, that's probably not a great, great outcome. But if you want to do such a thing, it should be possible. And the way to do that is to simply say, hey, here's a subnet. And to participate, uh, the, the, the requirements are different. And now then the final, final outcome or the final, final cases have to do with legal requirements that I alluded to in the first case, which is I'm a US institution. I have compliance requirements and I cannot transact with North Korea. We do not want to be in the business of sending money to, uh, to embargoed countries. And uh, why might you have to say this? I, I, I should, this should not require having to repeat it. But anyway, let me just mention it out loud because the crypto space ends up uh, ends up attracting people uh, who are not exactly in touch with with our current reality. Which, but um, uh, in our world today, uh, the the financial institutions are under are under serious obligations to make sure that the counterparty to every trade has been KYC AML. They are bound by that. You have to be able to give them a way to uh, to to accomplish their compliance requirements, or else they cannot use any of the cool tools we are inventing. The permissionless networks are fantastic sandboxes. They're great for playing. They're wonderful. But the vast majority of the liquidity of the funds in, on Wall Street are unable to partake because they cannot come in. Technologically, they cannot come in. So once you have subnets, you can create walled gardens. You can create a subnet where, for example, participants are KYC AML. You can create a subnet for the US. You can create a subnet for, that upholds GDPR requirements for the EU. You can create a subnet for China and, and for other localized jurisdictions. So this opens up the space. And it also opens up the spectrum of possibilities between permissionless and permission networks. You no longer have just these two extreme endpoints. You don't just go from, OK, well, I'll use Ethereum or I'll create my own permission thing, and in six months, I'm going to watch it die. There is a, a far greater range of possibilities in the middle. And in that range, you can have a semi-open network. You can say something like, look, here's my subnet. And to join it, you have to sign this agreement. So what, what's that legal agreement going to say? Well, it's going to say whatever your legal department tells you it should say. And suddenly, that gives you the way to, to fulfill whatever obligations you might have. That's a very, very interesting idea, if you, if you ask me. It's a very simple idea. Um, but it took about a decade to come up with it. The uh, systems that came before Avalanche, um, minus the two, um, and I'll name them, it's, uh, it's uh, Cosmos and Polkadot. Uh, those are the only, the, the three of us are the only systems that have any notion of uh, subnet-like ideas. Okay, So um, uh, every other system that came before us is a one-size-fits-all system. They have a single network, and, um, and that's all they know to, to maintain. And um, that single network is under the laws of no single jurisdiction. It's not compliant. And so any compliance you have to build on top in some Frankenstein manner. And uh, it, is, it is, I think, much more elegant to be able to build entire subnets that are part of a cohesive whole and can communicate with it and can at times interact with it it when necessary, when appropriate, when that subnet creator says it's okay. And that's an amazing new ability. Now, uh, what kind of an ability is it? It's a jump in the same manner that the jump from Bitcoin to Ethereum was. It's an ability that I know the Bitcoin maximalists fail to see as a new thing. To them, it's like, why would you need that? Just, just build it in, you know, on top of Ethereum using, using bytecode. Well, maybe you can do some of these things using bytecode on top of Ethereum, but at some point you will get nickel and dime to that. 
that uh, the gas fees will be insanely, insanely high. And uh, some of these things you just cannot do at that layer because they, they impact what you do at the very lowest layer. I mean, there are certain things like a real estate subnet. You have severe obligations for archival le level storage if you want to hold real estate data. And uh, none of our networks, none of the permissionless networks are up to the task. But you can have an avalanche subnet that can actually hold these land records in a manner that's actually uh, archival quality. So the, uh, the space of use cases that this opens up is immense. And, uh, and that bears repeating, actually. So um, I don't know why other chains have failed to see this. Um, and I do know why some of them have failed to evolve in this direction. But uh, bottom line, um, this, I believe, is the, the, the key to opening up uh, the, uh, the, the huge, vast variety of, uh, of trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of assets that are on bank balance sheets, institutional balance sheets, and in com on company balance sheets, and getting them onto blockchain form. So to that end, expect a lot of exciting uh, developments from Avalanche in the months to come uh, on the subnet front. I'm really excited. I'm also really excited, again, about subnets that are specific for crypto-native uses. So one thing we can do with Avalanche is we can create a subnet that subsumes an already existing coin. So there are many coins out there that are hampered by their consensus protocols. They're very slow, but they have something valuable. And that valuable thing is their user and coin distribution. They have an active community. There's a set of people who are wedded to, uh, to that system. And uh, they want to see it flourish. And in many cases, they are hampered by the fact that their consensus protocol is limited in scale, speed, latency, performance, throughput, whatever, you name it, they're limited. So what we could do uh, very, very easily is take their virtual machine, strip it of its, you know, whatever they're using. Typically, they'll be using some variant of proof of work or some variant of, uh, of a protocol from 1999. Um, and so take that crap out and uh, put a proper modern consensus protocol underneath. And then suddenly, and, and import as, it's, as the genesis vertex of a new subnet, their current balances. So take a snapshot, move it over. So suddenly you'll have that exact same system, whatever coins you had in, 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 in coin X are going to be in the avalanche subnet version of coin X. And now you can trade, you can do everything you want super fast. And, uh, and if you do this right, you might be able to maintain compatibility with all of the old tooling, if that's what you choose. Or if you do it some other way, you will be able to maintain compatibility with and leverage the, uh, uh, the tooling from Avalanche, one or the other, whichever one you prefer. So that's where we are. And uh, seems like a simple idea. And uh, seems like somebody else should have come up with it. Um, you know, I was a professor at Cornell and I was looking around at this, this sort of universe of coins. And it struck me that every single coin came in with a sliver of an idea. Take one existing thing and add just one tiny bit and one tiny bit. And, um, and that's just not how we work at Avalanche. And so, um, so the way I approached this was, no, let me take everything I know from the best of the science of, of distributed systems and best from the science of economics and, and fi financial technologies, and, uh, and best from whatever I have seen from, uh, from the crypto space, having been in it for so, so long, um, and come up with something that really does advance the state of the art in multiple directions. I think I talked to you. No, I don't think I talked to you about the consensus protocol behind Avalanche. I've given many talks about it. I haven't done it on this podcast. I'm not going to do it now. Um, but not only do we have an enormous innovation in the form of the Avalanche Consensus Protocol. But we also have an enormous innovation in the shape of these subnets. Subnets completely change the game. So that's my uh, something that's been on my mind. We've been spending a lot of time on, uh, on advanced support for subnets, on how to change them, how to change our APIs, how to make them better, and so forth. Really, really excited. And uh, great things are about to come in the months ahead. So uh, that's uh, that's. Item number one on my, uh, on my, uh, you know, on on my mind. Um, let's see. So, uh, uh, what happened? Uh, what else happened this this week? So, lots of exciting other other exciting things happened. Um, I saw an interesting interesting tweet yesterday. It was yes, two days ago. I saw a tweet from 
from uh, block one. And um, I don't know if you guys remember block one, but uh, this was the company behind the EOS uh, EOS uh, <coughs> EOS system. And so let me uh, let me kind of expand my notes here. So uh, what uh, what the tweet said was essentially the EOS Foundation, the CEO of the EOS Foundation said, um, EOS as it stands is a failure. I was sad to see this, and um, uh, you know EOS has been around with us for some time. It came into the scene with a lot of fanfare. I think it raised uh, at least four billion dollars. So that's a big raise, right? And uh, and at one time it was a big system, and uh, and if if you are part of a system and and the people in that system don't understand why EOS failed, then um, then you need to be careful. Um, and uh, so it, it got me thinking. It got me thinking about why did EOS fail? Why why is it that I've managed to sort of over time manage to find and pick these projects that generally did okay, and uh, and what is it that one should look for? When uh, when somebody is looking around for uh, for interesting blockchain projects, so um, so I think it it comes down to just a few things. So I could just kind of wanted to rant about what it is that I look for. This is also a rant about what it is that we at Ava Labs or we at the Avalanche Foundation um, look for in our newly announced ecosystem fund, and, and what is it that I look for when somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, I've got a great new idea." So. There are really three things that really, really matter, I think, in this space. The very first one is technological innovation. Behind every project, there has to be some sliver of an idea, at least a sliver of an idea, that makes it unique and that creates a technical moat. The best moats are technical. So um, as, as companies lose their grip on the, on the technical moat, what they end up doing is they end up coming up with business modes. That's also fine. It's an okay thing to do. And then for having failed at both, they try to create legal and regulatory modes, right? Look at Wall Street today. They have so many uh, regulatory modes to protect their markets and they love it, right? They, 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 they cherish that. That's part of part and parcel of what they do because what they do is just shuffle money around mostly and, uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's uh, they they have highly replicable business models. So one one way that they keep the newcomers out is by creating regulatory modes. Anyway, I digress. Going back to um, to what is it that one should look for when one is looking into blockchain projects is is really simple. There are three things. The first one is technological innovation. There has to be something there that sets this thing apart from other projects around it in the same space. So EOS did not have this. EOS ended up using a consensus protocol that is substantially the same as some of the earliest protocols from the 80s. It's the signature accrual mechanism. And uh, it didn't have a con uh, correctness proof. So already in my, at least in my mind, big red flag. And, um, uh, and so it's the same, by the way, it's the exact same consensus protocol as is uh, planned, as is used for a lot of chains, as is uh, planned for a lot of chains. So I think Solana is using it. Ethereum 2 is planning to use it. It's the same sort of idea. Ethereum 2 has a lot of other things going with it. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, on any given decision, on any given single decree is what we call it, a single block's acceptance, um, it's just a matter of collecting enough signatures from the set of nodes that are part of that round. That's, that's all it comes down to. And, uh, and there are very well-known limitations with the, these protocols. Um, the main limitation is the number of participants in each round is highly limited. In EOS, from the get-go, they had only 21 validators. And um, that's a, a very, very, very small number of, of, uh, of uh, decentralized nodes. Now, uh, I also urge you, again, on a side rant, I urge you to go to the, uh, the web page that lists the number of mining pools on Bitcoin or the number of mining pools on uh, on Ethereum, etc., and take a look at how many how many validators, how many miners you see there, how many mining pools you see there. So uh, you'll find that. Uh, so in my mind, a mining pool is essentially identical to a company, whether or not they filed a, a, a company uh, incorporation document with a state is immaterial to me. Those people are working together. Uh, they're part of the same singly, uh, the same entity controlled by a single entry point. Uh, that is working cooperatively together and they're creating a single block together. 
and a single point of failure will make them all fail at the same time. It doesn't matter how many miners are part of the same mining pool. There's a single singular entity when it comes down to a single mining pool. So, um, you know, none of these chains are all that decentralized. And um, uh, 21 is just way too slow, way too small. And, uh, and there's a reason for this. These protocols don't scale well when you add more validators into them. And EOS suffered from this. EOS would be at a very different place if it had 10,000 validator participants. It only had 21. And so that's, that's a problem. And, uh, uh, but the fact is, if it had 10,000, the protocol wouldn't work because it requires 10,000 to 10,000 communication. And uh, that's a very large number, 100 million packets flying around. It's just too, 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 too many. And uh, you would not be able to run your, your chain at any speed. So in some sense, that was, uh, that was one, one big failure, I think, um, that, that led to EOS's failure as, as uh, admitted by the, the head of the EOS Foundation. I didn't think EOS had failed, by the way, but now that the EOS Foundation CEO says it, well, then I have to take it at face value and say, hey, it failed. So if you're gonna flame me saying, oh, EOS is still alive, I thought so too. Um, these things never die, they should never die. Um, but if he's saying it's dead, then uh, or if it's saying it's, it's failed, then that's fine. We'll, we'll take it. So the second thing, um, second reason why these things fail, they need a product market fit. So you need to have a product and uh, you need to have a market and your product must have the technical capabilities to fit that market. You can't just take someone else's vision and rebrand it and call it, you know, a, a new thing. Okay. Um, I mean, you could, right? What what does that get you? Essentially, you're saying everybody who came before me, who had the ex who did the exact same thing, doesn't know what they are doing. They're not executing. I will distinguish myself by execution. But then, usually, the execution is is kind of hard to distinguish. Everybody has the same pain points, and EOS is, EOS did not execute all that well. EOS's product um, and and market uh, were were not very good. The product was this general chain. And uh, to, to deploy smart contracts, you had to write them in C++. And um, that was, a, you know, the technological foundation wasn't there. And the, the, very, the very core idea was one that was essentially copied from Bitcoin. It's substantially the same thing. Single network, single coin, uh, a very cumbersome way of deploying new smart contracts. Um, so that was, that was not going to go anywhere. But the third thing I think is the one that I kind of got stuck on that, that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and it really distinguishes the, um, the successful teams from those that make a splash and disappear. And this has never failed me. Um, so I always try to meet the founders. I always try to get like 10 minutes of talking to uh, a team before I make a, you know, I, I, I do any kind of a, you know, serious, uh, whatever it is, like serious endorsement uh, um, with them. And, uh, and when I do, within like 10 minutes, you kind of size people up. And the main thing I want to size people up for isn't technical acumen, it isn't connections, it isn't, well, you know, whatever else that they might have that's going for them. It is dedication. One of the perverse things in this space that we're in is that it's all too easy to, uh, to get to a point where the founders, where the people involved are, uh, are compensated. So in the traditional world, in the old days, you know, when I was going to grad school and so on, you would come up with an idea um, and then you go to venture capital, you'd get some seed capital, you'd have successive rounds of funding. And, uh, and then ultimately you would either sell your company an exit event, or you would IPO your company, another exit event. And that's how, you, how the, the, the founders were compensated. But in these uh, token universes, it's often very, very easy for the founders to find a lot of liquidity and, uh, and then suddenly disappear on you. And, um, and so one of the main things to check for is what drives this team? What is it that they're going after? And if it's pure abject, you know, it's an asinine play for, for, uh, for coins, cash, et cetera, then it's, it never lasts. So one of the things that helps is if there is a true technical innovation, then it's a very different game because that's going to allow the team to persevere. Or maybe it's going to allow the very first three, the, the initial founder to, to exit, but perhaps other people will step into their shoes as often happens after an IPO uh, in the traditional world. Uh, but if the, 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 the original team is completely uh, dedicated, if they are there to change the world, 
then it's a different ball game. If they're committed for decades to come, it's a different ball game. And one of the big successes, I think, of, of the Ethereum community has, has stemmed from this. Uh, Vitalik is purely committed to, uh, to Ethereum. And, uh, and I can't imagine a world where he exits. So, uh, so of course, I would uh, say immediately that Avalanche is exactly the same way. We're committed to our very core, all of us. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the goal here is show the world that the way it's treated blockchains is wrong. It's, mis it's conceptions about blockchains, that they're slow, that they are outside the law, that they cannot, um, they cannot fit or interact with, with uh, existing systems. These are all wrong. And we can have um, blockchains that are not only fast, but green, not only green, but cheap, and not only all of these things, but also potentially compliant where the assets need to be compliant with local laws. That's part of... Uh, of our value proposition. And that's part of what we truly believe and are here to show the world. So I'm really excited about this. I knew as, as soon as I saw the, the departures from, from block one, that, this days were, that the days of EOS were numbered. And uh, then I saw this uh, EOS announcement. It made me sad, to be honest. It felt like oh, a piece of history is being lost. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I was sad to see that happen. Uh, but I wasn't surprised because uh, the departures, the technical team departures, are really, really, uh, really important, and, and they they end up affecting uh, the uh, the system very, very much. So uh, let's see, uh, what else do I want to talk about today? Uh, there's a oh, there's a whole bunch of things to talk about. Um, uh, let me see if I can. Uh, um, there is a uh, there is some okay so. There's this thing going on um, that I noticed. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, you know, there's this meme coin thing going on. So what's this meme coin thing? There's a lot of boomers out there who are, who are going to say terrible things about meme coins. I'm not one of them. Uh, memes are great. I love memes themselves. Um, and coins that are, um, are memed into existence, they are a thing. And as a scientist, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge things that our senses tell us. So if these things can have huge amounts of value, then they're valuable. Okay. So far be it for me to uh, to denigrate any meme coin. Okay. So that's not um, what uh, what you know. That's not my angle. Um, there are many others out there who, especially, are older, who have a traditional background in finance. And they want to do, you know, they want to ask things like, what's the P.E. ratio of Dogecoin? And that's obviously a plaintively ridiculous question. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it sounds kind of funny. But, um, but there is this thing going on. There's a phenomenon, and I've been thinking about it, which is everybody wants to find the next big thing that's going to explode. Right? I mean, that's a very human, natural response. Doge is very high. That's fantastic. And then you go after that and you say, well, we're not Doge, but we're going to have something like Shiba. And uh, then suddenly Shiba starts going up. And, um, and what happens in these systems is it's a pure momentum play. Everybody in that system knows that there, there isn't that longevity, that it's not here, like this thing is not going to be around for 20 years. That's not that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but it's going up right now, and so one might as well jump on it. That's the thinking. And, um, and it's a fine thing to do, right? And uh, I mean, it's an understandable thing to do. Um, a lot of the thinking also comes from you know, well, I missed this, I missed that, and I don't want to miss this other thing. So I missed Bitcoin. I wasn't there in 2011 when it was, you know, five bucks, and um, I came afterwards, and da da da. da. So so now I don't, and then I missed Ethereum because I never thought, you know, it would things could work that way, and blah blah blah. And then I got freaked out about the trusted computing base size or whatever it is that people you know, were using as the bogeyman for, for, uh, for Ethereum. And so I didn't buy into that. And uh, then there was a Vox, but you know, I didn't do that either, et cetera. Now I want to jump onto this thing. One could do that, right? I call this the search for the next Avox. Avox ended up doing a meteoric rise to where it is today. And uh, um, it's, you know, that's nice to see, of course. And uh, there's much more upside, you know, as, but of course, as always, I think I should also mention, there's also downside to all of these potential downside to every single investment. Um, but, um, but, uh, but the main point here is 
um, people are looking for for uh, for that next big train that's going to be the next big dominant paradigm, or at least uh, the temporary dominant paradigm, the thing that everybody else also loves. And in so doing, they can meme into existence a coin. Um, oh, actually, on this topic, on a side note, let me just mention SmartCoin is doing incredible marketing, amazing, brilliant marketing. If you haven't checked it out, go take a look. Um, I haven't checked it out, so it's not an endorsement. Um, all I've done is, is read some of their tweets, and it, they, they are just funny, irreverent, and amazing. So uh, they, if there's a team out there that knows how to do marketing, it is that team. And, um, and so do take a look. But, uh, uh, but the bottom line is people are looking for that next thing that's kind of like the next Avox. Well, uh, you know, what is it that you're looking for when you look for the next Avox? Well, I just told you what it is that I look for. Technological innovation, product market fit, dedicated team. And, uh, and I look around and, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're running a race, you kind of look over your shoulder to see who else is around you and so on. And I just don't see anything that even comes close. So I had a tweet the other day that says, Avox is the next Avox and uh, had fun writing it. And, uh, and I think uh, those of you who, who know the Avox system understand that it's right on point. There is nothing that compares in terms of technology, uh, in terms of product market fit, and uh, and so go take a look at that, and uh, you know at least play around with the bridge. It's kind of fun. It's uh, world leading. There is no bridge as cheap or as easy and pleasant to use. Um, and one of the things that I've found, I think a lot of people have found this, and there were a bunch of tweets in in response saying, "Hey, you know, having used the Vox, I just can't go back." And they're not saying it's not it's not flattering. They're kind of like. Like I can't go back. <laughs> I want to, but I can't. It's just so painful. So, uh, and it's it's certainly something that I've suffered from. So, um, you know, my MetaMask defaults to Avalanche, of course. And if I open up MetaMask and I have to do some some operation on some other chain, it's just painful. Like it's just uh, you know those those days are, are far behind. There's better technology in the world now. So um, let me see. So um, there is. Uh, there's a bunch of tweets that I sent out. Oh, there's a cool announcement. There's Snowtrace uh, that got uh, uh, that got deployed on Avalanche. So go to snowtrace.io. Um, so it's like Etherscan, but it's for Avalanche. Uh, so it's got all of the cool features of Etherscan that you might be used to. Um, if if you were upset about the uh, the uh, the the old explorer. Uh, called Block Scout that Ava Labs was running. There were other explorers also on Avalanche, but the old explorer that Ava Labs was running was absolutely horrible. Um, it was uh, it was a pain to maintain as well. It's written in some strange language that uh, very few of us at the company know how to edit, and uh, so uh, that's going to be uh, retired soon. And uh, Snowtrace is coming in. Snowtrace is beautiful. So just take a look. You'll be able to see all of your tokens. You'll be able to track track every transaction down to bytecodes and so on. And um, and uh, go take a look. Uh, having said that, don't forget about Ava Scan. I played with that recently as well. It also just recently added some C chain support, and uh, it also shows very very insightful, very interesting. Um, uh, the details of transactions, and it's got that design aesthetic that I happen to love. It's like you can tell that it came from uh, from a designer's hand that has uh, that is surrounded by well designed elements around them. So um, uh, just just love that interface as well. So go take a look. We have some cool explorers now. Um, so uh, oh yeah, okay. So I was on uh, I was on um, uh, on radio in Boston. I got uh, I got interviewed. Um, because uh, uh, essentially, I think there's an NPR station in Boston. They have noticed that a lot of people are employed by DAOs. So that's a strange, uh, strange development. I never thought we'd be here until, um, until uh, I guess a few months ago, when Pangolin started employing people. Pangolin, you'll remember, is a community-owned project. Okay, it was created on chain. Nobody at the time held any Pangolin coins, any PNG coins, and um, the coin just got started and started collecting uh, liquidity, started offering AMM services, etc. And um, and Pango now uh, employs people around the globe. We're working very hard to improve the system. Uh, I think uh, Ave is in a similar situation. I think they're doing a very similar, substantially similar thing. Um, I heard from. Um, 
my friend Eric Voorhees uh, a couple couple months ago that he's uh, Daoizing his entire company. The entire exchange is turning into a big Dao. So it's a fascinating world out there. We're now working for the robot masters, and uh, there will be more and more of this. And um, and the beautiful thing of a universe like this is that much of the business flow is transparent, is auditable, is easily, easily checkable by the external public. So, um, you know, those of us who kind of grew up uh, with, with all these like charity, fake charities, that was a big thing in the 90s. People would collect money for a charity and then they'd spend it all on themselves. New laws were enacted, et cetera, et cetera. Charity can only spend, I think, you know, there's a limit how much of the money you 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 raise you can spend on yourself. But that limit is insanely high. I think it's like 80% or something. And I'm making this up. Uh, I haven't checked this recently. But, um, you know, there were all sorts of scams in the real world. Um, blockchains erase all these. They're just a much better infrastructure for doing business. And we don't have to take anybody's word. You can just say, this is what I do. Here's my contract. And uh, you can, anybody can audit it. And then suddenly you're in a different universe. So um, that's sort of, you know, the things I had in my uh, on mind recently. Um, let me see if there are other things. Uh, oh, yeah, there are a bunch of things. So maybe uh, maybe I can I can bring up my screen here. This is all new tech. We decided to... Uh, um, we decided to change the way we do, um, let's see, we decided to change the way we do our, uh, these, uh, you know, rant hour with EGS, uh, episodes, all access with EGS. And, uh, so here are some things, uh, the metaverse, Facebook has decided that its brand is so toxic that it's going to change it entirely to meta. Um, high time, it's high time, right? They, they really played fast and loose. Um, so, uh, uh, so, you know, I tweeted about this earlier. I think in a lot of these co companies, uh, there are a couple of things that persevere no matter what the rebranding is and uh, the business models persevere. So if your business model is collect data on individuals, sell it to others, well then, you know, you're doing something evil and uh, you can try to sort of put pretty little things around it. You can, you can say, do no evil is your motto or you can, you can do whatever you want. But at the end of the day, you're building a surveillance panopticon and um, that's what you're doing. So anyway, um, uh, and the second thing that perseveres is really the values of the founders. If the founder is is this sort of crazy creature that's that's sort of hell bent on collecting information and uh, can hardly believe it himself, and uh, yeah, you know, you know the story. Um, so it's just going to be there, no matter what what they do, no matter what they call themselves. What's really happening behind the scenes is that there is a shift in business models. There's the old business models. There's the client-server model. There's a, we, we are the client. Somebody provides us a service. Zuckerberg provides us a service. He is in a position of control. We are we are plebs in his universe, and uh, then he monetizes us and our data any which way he chooses to a different universe with different a multitude of different business models. And that universe is exciting. It's really really different. It's it's richer, and uh, maybe it's not as lucrative yet. But we are now beginning to see that it too can be very, very, very lucrative. And, uh, and really what's happening is a big fight as we establish those new business models. What's the payment structure? What's the business model structure for these new services to come on Web3? So I'm really excited about this. And, uh, and so uh, the metaverse, the actual metaverse that people use will not be provided by I mean, there might be metaverses that people use in the same sense that there are games that I use that I don't care about. I don't do anything meaningful in them. But the metaverse, the one that I would spend my time in, is not going to be, um, you know, is not going to be something provided by Meta, formerly for Facebook. It's going to be something built on a blockchain. In the same same way that the internet I browse is not CompuServe, it's the internet and it's built on an open foundation. So that's really key. So whatever Facebook might do, however much Facebook might be worth, uh, there's a blockchain solution out there that's far bigger than that. 
So uh, let me see. Are there more things? There are probably more things that I can discuss here. Um, whoop. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, Microsoft's uh, take on the metaverse is coming next year. It will have PowerPoint and Excel. Kill me already. Like, this is, this is their vision. It sounds absolutely horrible. Um, I talked about subnets. I don't want to go back into them, but they are uh, uh, they're a big, big idea. I think I'm going to, uh, to stop here. Um, yeah, we can talk about TVL. There's a lot of TVL on, uh, on Avalanche. Depending on how you count, uh, this count is, is uh, coming from, I think, DeFi Llama. Uh, it's undercounting, um, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's increasing quite a bit. And, um, and uh, it's, it's nice to see that, that increase in TVL. Um, yeah, I think these are just the visuals for some of the things I talked about. I think at this point, I kind of want to stop and uh, maybe start taking some questions from the audience for, um, uh, for, uh, for Q&A. I guess well, there are already asked questions, so maybe, maybe they will pop up. And if they pop up here, if my producer can figure out, okay. Oh, would like there to be a detailed comparison of subnets versus optimistic rollups, pros and cons, honestly. Okay, um, this, is, this is a great question. And um, uh, where do I start? I, I barely have seven minutes. I wanted to get to many more questions than this. Um, so rollups, no, let's keep it up there. That's a good question. Let, let me handle it. And then, uh, then we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll see if we have time to, uh, to handle others. So in a roll-up, you have the following scenario. Um, in a, okay, where I rather? In a subnet, you have the scenario I described before. You have an entirely new network, right? You have a subnetwork, and it's got some decentralization features that you and I and everybody else can audit. We know exactly what this network is composed of. We know exactly what... Uh, protocols it uses for achieving some kind of a whatever it is doing, a partial order or a total order inside that subnet. And um, and so so there is there, you know it's it's a well understood quantity. Now rollups are different. Um, there are many different rollup technologies. Um, the um, the the main issue with with rollups is that what you end up having what you end up doing is you end up taking a smart contract or a set of smart contracts out from the underlying chain and you start executing in a tiny, small environment where it can execute very efficiently. Transactions are posted into that environment, they execute there, and then you net it out, so to speak, uh, down onto the underlying chain. So that's the core idea. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decent idea. I mean, it could, it, there, are, there are reasons for why you would actually be, be drawn to it. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, there are lots of different uh, roll-up technologies. I think this question is about optimistic roll-ups. I don't want to um, to focus on any one technology. I just want to do a big, broad stroke comparison. And maybe what I should do is come back to this later on in a different episode and and uh, talk about it there. But at a very, very uh, quick level, at a very simple level, there are a couple of things that are um, pros and cons. So the the speed at which a subnet can be run is limited. It's limited by your decentralization needs. So the more decentralized you make it, the, the slower it's gonna be. And, uh, and so that's your problem. So typically you want some amount of decentralization. Typically you want a huge amount of censorship resistance. Typically you want some guarantees about how transactions in that subnet will, will execute. So you want something that is decentralized and uh, the peak performance of such a protocol is, is going to be limited at some, some rate. So, uh, so Avalanche is, I believe, the fastest of these protocols. And, uh, but, you know, Avalanche cannot do, at the moment, cannot do 100,000 transactions per second uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, thousands of validators in it as of right now. Okay, so that's not possible today. Um, I believe it's going to be possible in the future with some of the changes that I can uh, I can talk about later on, uh, but uh, but it's not possible right now. Um, it may be possible with a roll up, but at some great cost. 
So how is it possible with a roll-up? Well, you know, I take a smart contract, I put it into my laptop, essentially, I put it up into a server, and now you can interact with this thing super, super, super fast at the speed of that single node. Now, I could have done that with a subnet, that's a single node, by the way, if you trusted it. Um, typically, roll-ups use uh, technologies that, that prohibit that single node from misbehaving. But what's the uh, downside? Well, the downside is this. That single node is in command of, um, of sequencing everything that's happening. That's one of the big drawbacks. So any MEV, any minor extractable value or validator extractable value goes to the execution environment around the rollup. And so that's typically a huge handoff, a huge, huge handoff. So it's like saying, I don't like the way Wall Street works because people are front running my trades. So I'm gonna have Citadel, famous for front running trades, um, run my exchange. Well, you know, maybe you're doing something wrong there, you know, buddy, you gotta, gotta kind of back up and reevaluate what it is that's just happening. So the MEV situation with rollups is something that is uncharacterized, um, at least to my knowledge, although I have to admit that I haven't checked this stuff. And, um, and Ethereum folks have a habit of publishing something, you know, 10 minutes ago and then jumping on your in your in your in your uh, comments and saying, how dare you not know what I published 10 minutes ago? And so, you know, if there's something out there that that uh, that they came up with to reduce MEV in a roll up, I'd like to know. But to my knowledge, it's a huge unsolved problem and a huge giveaway to the roll up execution environment. The second issue, of course, with roll ups is that they divide your liquidity. There are those smart contracts that run in um, in in some optimistic roll-up scenario and uh, there are those that that run in some other roll-up you know some you know let's say zk uh zero knowledge roll-up scenario so suddenly these things don't cannot communicate with each other uh, the short term short phrase for referring to this is lack of composability so smart contracts for, that are using roll-ups don't compose liquidity gets divided it becomes a big pain in the neck to write your smart contracts in a manner that's compatible typically uh, that's infeasible and you end up dividing your network and the third and final thing i'm going to say is this and it's um, it's from the point of view of a system designer so from the point of view so if you look at this as a system designer you're always looking at it from the point of view from an external point of view from the eye, eye, eye point of 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 god himself so you're looking down at the at the emergent system. So what do we normally have? We have Ethereum and we have users. We have Ethereum, we have smart contracts, and we have we have users of the smart contract. With a roll-up world, well, we have Ethereum. Now you have multitude of roll-ups, and then you have uh, smart contracts written specifically for those roll-ups, and uh, and you've got uh, you've got users using them. The nice thing that the blockchain gave you was an easy way to rendezvous with other users. In this roll-up universe, the rendezvous, the, the act of finding who it is that you should, you should transact with is actually very difficult. The, the beauty of a blockchain was it was flat, it was easy access. And now suddenly you have to worry about, well, okay, how do I find the smart contract that I want to interact with? How do I invoke it? Under which roll-up uh, system are they, are they configured? How do I make an invocation to that area? So those are all sort of easy, easy, easy worries that I should mention. Um, there is uh, there is more easily many, many more things that uh, that one could one could raise about rollups. Oh, data availability, huge problem with rollups. Uh, this is actually a big, big technical problem. So we're in a rollup. So we moved our our, our uh, smart contract into the rollup. We did a billion transactions, and everything's going beautifully. And uh, and we ended up netting everything, and we're going to just record the net on chain. So that's good, right? It sounds like a great thing. But now somebody contests what it is that happened in the roll-up. Well, you now have a problem. You did a billion transactions. You had to do them in the roll-up because you wanted to, 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 to proceed through a, a billion transactions. And, uh, and now that somebody's challenging you, these fraud proofs will actually take quite a lot of time uh, to, uh, to go through. The underlying chain may not have the capacity to go through the, the, uh, the fraud proof. When might you need a fraud proof? Well, under those circumstances, when the, uh, the price is moving the most. And what happens to chains when the price moves the most? Well, they, that's when they are busiest. So 
all of a sudden, under the heaviest use case scenarios, you suddenly have to pay huge sums of money for uh, for doing uh, fraud proofs potentially. So these are all issues that exist with rollups. And uh, as I said, from the point of view of a system designer, you always want to look, what does the user see underneath them? What is it that you're designing? Because if you're designing just the core and you're saying there's going to be a bazillions of, of, of layer twos, you're really designing a multi-headed Hydra type thing. So what the user sees is your system plus more, your system plus the rollup. That's what you design. And you outsource the design of the rollup to some other party. You're saying, this is the best I could do here. Now you come and plug this. And, and my system is going to be a multi-headed thing. There's, you're going to plug this. So Jimbo is going to plug that thing. And then you know Jane is going to plug this thing and so on. So now you're going to have a whole bunch of rollups side by side. Which one of these do people use? What's the elegance of the resulting system? So you know, little by little, you can easily reinvent the exact mess that Wall Street has over there. Like I'm just looking out the window here uh, to Wall Street. So, you know, they've got COBOL, they've got layers and layers of CRUD underneath. And, um, and so it seems to me that, uh, that an unfettered roll-up environment is going to look like a Frankenstein monster where people plug in these engines. And on top of each engine, there's like some range of smart contracts that cannot talk to the smart contracts on the other engines. And um, it doesn't seem like a too desirable an outcome to me. Um, but, you know, I might be biased, but I think I'm trying to do a, a fairly, uh, you know, objective assessment of these things. Um, I've thought about layer two solutions for quite some time, ever since we built T-Chain and T-Chain. And uh, they're just hard to use. It's just not the user experience of a rollup is, is really not, not that great. And of course, there's always the exit latency, right? When are things final in a rollup? Well, they're final when they come out. So when do they come out? Well, when they come out is when, when they check back on the main chain, and that can take a long, long time. So if that's your time to finality, well, you know, you lost a lot there. And if you're willing to make that trade-off in, 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 in terms of time to finality, then I can build you many, many, many other chains, uh, layer ones that are even more high throughput than what you would get with a roll-up. So anyhow, quick, quick response to that one. Uh, my voice is uh, cracking up even more than normal. I'm going to uh, probably take uh, none of the other great questions that I got um, yesterday. So uh, what I think I should do is stop right here and, um, and uh, defer those other questions to next week. Can't wait to chat with you all. Um, I enjoy these things. They're kind of random rants. They're all over the place. But I hope you get something out of them as well. And um, at least they're soul cleansing for me. They allow me to... Uh, to to express what my thoughts are in some you know un, unstructured form at least and um, I probably misspoke you know I will probably misspeak if I do I'll try to correct the record um, it's very difficult to to respond to a gazillion topics or, and speak on a range of topics uh, without too much prep ahead of time and be accurate in every sentence so um, uh, but as I said I'm human I might make mistakes if I do we'll correct them um, but I hope this these give you a sense of uh, the world according to from from my perspective and I hope you get a vision you get an idea of the vision that's that's driving the avalanche effort it's very different from many other people I keep repeating this let me end on this note we are not here to build a single currency for the world this is not what we're trying to do with a box a box is an essential currency it powers the most most important of functions but we're not posing it as something that replaces the dollar that's bitcoin's job Bitcoin is doing a great job of that. We are not here as a general computational platform. Ethereum does it. It's fantastic. I love Ethereum 1. I understand it. It's fantastic. And, uh, um, and it's, it's a great platform. It's a great playpen. It's a great sandbox. That's, that's where all this DeFi craziness has come in from. And it's been an amazing revolution. It's going to change what Wall Street does. We are here, if it, if it would change it rather, if it could scale. We are here to digitize all the world's assets. And to do that, we have a very different architecture. I hope you got a glimpse of what subnets bring. And there will be questions on this. I will mention only one sentence on it. Subnets are essentially the way to shard. You create functionally distinct networks that don't have to talk to each other. Why? Because they don't have to. Right? Whatever you're doing in this universe is fundamentally different from whatever is happening inside this other subnet. And so therefore, you don't have to connect them. 
they don't have to have the same nodes in them. They are subject to different rules, different VMs, different nodes. So that's a huge difference. So if you want to do sharding, the right way to do it is with subnets. You get all the effective benefits of sharding, but none of the headaches um, if you were to try to do sharding in a more traditional way, as some people are trying to do. So I'm skeptical of those. And, uh, and I think, uh, I hope you got a glimpse of what we are building, what we're after. It is no less than reimagining the entire financial infrastructure of the globe. And uh, I hope you will, uh, you will be on this journey with us. Take care. Thank you very much.